Um, so before we get going, um, just a quick one for you, Kath, um, John. I noticed a common mistake you're making with your iron shoes. Okay, and so I picked you up with the shoes you sent in the other day, and I see it the last shoes you sent in the clips. I noticed on the hinds as well. You've got your nice flowing toe bend, but rather than stopping where the toenail is, it the bends going round into the into the rest of the shoe. So I'm going to show you what to do and how to fix that. So the shoes you've already made, you can get an all over heat at home and just pull this out. And then we'll move on to what we're going to talk about soon. I was going to message you about it earlier, purely and simply, because it's just something you, you keep doing. Okay. So this, this shoe here, you know, where it clips it, kind of goes round beyond the clips. Remember, we should have our toe bend, stops at the nail holes, then becomes the straight quarters. About there, mate. Just squat down. No, squat down so you can see through the amber. Yeah, I know what you mean. I know no, what you mean. No, too Ow. close. There. Okay, so it's right at the centre. So you're looking down, looking down the barrel of the gun. Okay. So this is what we need to do. Is get our toenail there. See there's air behind it, and where the clip is, tap. And then from that point, there, straighten it. Literally, that is all you need to do. It's tap, tap, straight, 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 straight. And that will just give you that more defined toe shape. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about stud holes and traction devices. We're basically going to cover stud holes because the rest of them don't really involve us actually sort of like with a forge. We can drill um, plug holes and flat shoes, we can drill the road pins in, road nails, etc. So stud holes are real forging thing. I have prepared a le lecture PowerPoint presentation on traction devices. I will upload that by tomorrow. So make sure you read back through that. I'll upload that onto Facebook. You can just read through it. Okay, it will be sort of like a, a narrative to it as well. Okay. Um, um, so let's just talk about stud holes. Key thing about stud holes is position for a start is where on the shoe, do we put them? Well, there's a lot of people out there with different theories of where they think they should and shouldn't go. You always hear, my boss always likes to put them right back at the back of part of the shoe. My boss likes to put them right forward. At the end of the day, people have an opinion based on nothing other than that's just the way they do it isn't scientific fact. Now many of studies in the last well, like 10 years, 20 years have been done into the correct positioning for um, stud holes and other traction devices. Now again, if we go back through history, back in the days of shoes, bike, cork and wedge, okay, traction device, we're on the end of the shoe. The reason it was there, and the only reason it was there, was it's the only place it could go. You couldn't put the traction devices further up. And it was only when some guy decided that it was actually easier to just drive some holes, tap the holes out, and you can actually remove the stud holes to use them as and when you need them, is why we can do it today. And it now gives us the opportunity to actually place them in the shoe where they are best suited. Now, there has been science done, and they 
obviously, the further forward you, you go, you're going to cause kind of like a seesaw sort of rocker effect. So they do need to be in the back part, back half of the shoe. However, one of my pet peeves about putting them too far back is that's normally the area, because it's in the center of the steel, that's normally the area where the center of the heel is. And what you end up there is the um, heel will start to prolapse through that little tiny hole. And it does happen. And it just causes a distortion. So you, you want that part, that's the biggest weight bearing part of the actual uh, foot surface. That wants to be supported by flat steel, be it on a concave shoe, because it's on the other side, or on a flat shoe itself. They have, obviously, the fur, further forward you put them, the more grip it's going to give, but then the worse impact it's going to have on the foot. They have done lots of tests, and they the last one I read was that if you go halfway between your last nail hole and the last bearing point, so that's there, is the most efficient place to have them. And again, if you're putting two in, they need to be level. But that's level with the toenails, because obviously we're gonna be fitting one heel longer than the other, okay? And again, the other argument is, do you have one stud hole, do you have two? Do you have one row peak, do you have two row peaks? Now, the key thing with that is, is personal preference. Again, there's fours and against in both. Yes, Yes, if you've got two, you're going to have more balance. But remember, these studs, screwing studs, are designed to be used on a soft surface and then you turn. Once that's sunk in the ground, it doesn't make any difference. They weren't designed to be used on ropes. They weren't designed to be used for the horse to stand around and down the back of the horse box. More than anything, you're going to the back of your horse box. Okay? So, but the, the whole balance thing, is really neither here or there because it's a pinpoint kind of load with several hundred weight of horse that's going to sit even on rock hard ground like we have out there where we've not had any rain for a few days that is still going to sink into the muck okay why a lot of people are shy away from having two is the fact that as the horse is turning so if i'm turning the horse around if you have two studs in and the horse spins around, it can't pivot. That foot's going to stay pointing this way and I'm going to end up damaging my ligaments. This is why you see, I mean, we all know how macho football players actually really are. They're not, they're not like, uh, they're not soft or anything. These footballers are actually real hard, okay? But they're always having like soft tissue damage injuries to their legs because they're wearing football boots, which you've got a load of studs in. Do not allow the foot to pivot on the soft turf. Okay. So, so we've talked about where we're going to put these studs. We talked about where we're going to put these studs. Okay. So we're going to go halfway between last uh, nail hole and halfway between the hill. But whereabouts do we want it to come out? But if we look at the concave shoe, we've got the inside border, we've got the outside border. We want to aim not for the centre of the fullering, but the centre of the inside concave border. The reason that is, it's like if we just drill a hole in the centre of the shoe there, we're not going to have a complete collar. And I'll show you what I mean by that when I stamp it. So it's 360 degrees support around the stud. And that will mean that the stud's not supported and with the jarring of the actual horse's body weight and the traction, it will work out loose and fall out, okay? So we want a good 360 degree collar. This is why with concave shoes, we have to punch them. We have to hot punch them, but we don't get that, okay? Um, so to achieve that, if we look at our shoe, our fullering will run there. Our inside concave border will run there. So we're gonna to have to come to the inside of the midline to assure we get that flat spot so we can put our collar into it, okay? And remember, we're gonna go halfway. So we're looking at around there, okay? Now, I'm gonna do two methods here. I'm gonna back punch 
both of the holes. There's two ways of doing the studs. Okay, one of them, we go through the back of the section, we end up through this way, we end up with a flat spot. Now, if we've not got a drill, we need to punch back through the other way. That will give us a clear hole so we can get in there and tap it out. What I tend to do myself, a lot of people do nowadays, is back punch it through, fit the shoe, cool the shoe out, and then go over to the drill, back drill it, flip the shoe around, and then counter sink it. Obviously with a counter sink drill bit, you'll get a better um, thread in your shoe. I mean, the trouble is a lot of people, once that shoe starts to have a bit of wear and tear on it, people find it very difficult to get the, um, um, the stud in, start the thread. So this is why we always counter sink them, okay? Obviously if we've not got a drill, we can't counter sink it, okay? But, so what I wanna do, I'm gonna get a good heat on it, I'm gonna stud that, I'm gonna back punch that side, back punch that side, flick it over, I'll punch through that, but I'm gonna leave that one for the drill and I'll show you what I mean. Again, when we back punch these, we want a good heat, okay? We want a good heat, work fast, okay? We don't, the longer we're banging it, our tool, we're just gonna distort the end. Now this tool, this stud punch, I mean, I've had this since, a very long time actually probably I mean certainly for around 20 years okay it's had a lot of use but basically you know the end of it we've got an eight eight mil end of it and it tapers down to about a 10 mil okay that will give us the right size Some sub punches you see on the market are way too small and you can never get your um, your tap started. Okay, you end up snapping taps on it. Right, so here we go. Okay, key things with this is we're getting the right place Okay, but our hands up and straight. Okay, it's straight. All the way through, same on that side, put the inside a little bit then. When we spin that over now, you can see how we've got flat spots. That is what we're after. Level it flat, obviously don't squash the concave. Now, straight away, now it's cooled down. We don't want it too hot when we back punch this back through the other way. In the center of that flat spot, literally, one sharp hit over the corner of the hole. You will see the old bit of steel eject itself across the forge. Okay, so obviously, safety in mind, you need to be careful. Especially if you're doing this, at a livery yard or a little kids riding school because you don't want to be firing red hot round circle bits of steel <laughs> into the eyes of seven year old children. Okay. So that's one hole there. As you can see there, we've got 360 degrees of support, a collar all the way around the stud. This one, I haven't punched out because I'm going to show you how to do that, achieve that on the drill. Okay, but it's also important that you're flat over the back of the hole. Now, when that goes on the foot, the centre of the heel will be sat here. Okay, nowhere near that hole. If we stud right back at the back, very often you'll see polo ponies have got the stud hole right in the back of the heel. You'll always find that outside the heel is prolapsed through. Okay. And if it's got low weak hills behind anyway, you've got no chance whatsoever of achieving um, support to that hill. Okay, so get them up there, okay, a little bit further forward, let the hill have the support. Okay, so that's that. Right, so, 
Dogs to throw in. Okay, so we've got a drill. As you can see, this drill bit here. Okay, we've got 10 mil tapping drill. It's also got a counter sink on it. Okay, that will that will open up the top and give us a counter sink. Obviously, with this shoe already, I've just back punched that. Okay, with the punch. So I'm just going to counter sink it and show you what counter sinking is. If you don't already know. Not plugged in. One second. Plug it in there. Okay. Okay, so I'm just going to put the drill in. Obviously, the drill, uh, the hole's already fitted. Okay, we're just going to count the sink at the top of it. Very likely count the sink the hole. And there you can see now. I've got the counter sink in around the top. So once that's tapped out in there, you can start the thread very simply. So this one, which I've not back punched through. Okay, I've just punched it on that side. So what I'll do to continue this, what I normally do myself when I'm out shooting in the van, is I'll punch the hole through so I've got the collar, put my drill back into that, let me push down. Obviously you don't want to force it. Okay, and once it comes out the other side, Obviously, don't count the sink the um, foot surface. So I've got my hole there now. Okay, now I'll put it back through the other side and then I'll count the sink. Okay, just count the sink that one a little bit more. Okay, and that's the drilling done. Okay. Count the sink out. Right, come on. So then all we've got to do, we've got a 3-8 tap, okay, make sure it's a chamfered one to actually start it. Sometimes they come and they're kind of quite fat and blunt. Well, that's just for cleaning them out. That's not for starting the thread, okay? So get it in the hole, push down, very gently twist. Obviously, you can get drills, special drills to do this, um, impact drivers, or you can get special tapping machines to do it. This is the old handheld method, okay? Okay, once it starts to bite, go around a couple of times, half turn back. That stops the teeth from getting too um, filled up with the sort of metal you're cutting into. Okay, and just keep going all the way around. Go back a couple of turns. Go all the way through. All the way through, and it just will just spin out. Okay, I'll see what the other ones do. Go on. Let him have a go. Push down that. That way. Push down. Hang on, hold up. Also you gotta push down. Okay, get it to start to bite. Spin it back, half turn. I keep going. All the way through now. There you go, now come out. There you go. Okay. 
Now, when you learn how to do this, and you get your first stud punch, and you um, you can either buy them, you can make them. I personally, I'd rather buy them. Know what the tool still is to make a really good quality one. The other thing with stud punch which is really, really important. You see some people make them, and they make them about that long. Because you need them really hot to put it in, you will burn your hand. So make sure it's long enough. Not too long that you can't control it, but it's long enough so you don't burn your hand. That's really important. Um, thing is, once you've got it all working, you've tapped it up. Make sure you get a, ta uh, a stud and you make sure that it does work. Again, the amount of people have either got taps which, uh, sorry, punches which are either too big or too small. Okay, and then the clients are on the phone going, oh, I can't get my studs in. You know, which if it's not been done right to start with, okay. Okay, so there's our shoe, got some studs in. Okay, obviously with different size studs, but again, on the lecture or the PowerPoint presentation I put up tomorrow, all will be explained about studs. Um, okay, so, well, what would you do if it was a flat shoe? Okay, obviously this is the same. Obviously if it's flat shoe, we want to get a collar. If we punch, hot punch them in, we're going to displace it. You are better in this day and age to drill. Okay, so find the centre of the steel. Um, get your centre punch. Okay. Okay, that will give the drill something to get into. And it's simple. All we do then is we just drill straight through. Okay. side all the way through okay done Get it in there, get it to bite. Okay. Give it a quick check. Lovely. Super. Okay. Follow me, Bar. I'm going to show you something. Right. Let's find some of these. Hang on. Um, oh, here we go. Let me grab these and come out because you won't better see it too dark. Then. No, you can see. What we 
got here an old tree. So what we have here, some very old disused, old army horseshoes from back a long time ago. We've got quite a few crates of them here. I don't know why we've got them. We just have, okay? Again, these are all used to be brought already, drilled and tapped out. Okay, let's see if they still fit. But they don't. Look at that. These were probably made, and probably still got a date on somewhere. A3. No, it's not a date. No, it's just got an army number. But these probably were made Probably back in the 70s, if not 60s. And again, these stud holes still fit. Okay, there you go. Ancient these, stud holes still fit. Okay, because they were put in and done really well with correct salt. You know, if, if the client's struggling to get the um, stud holes in, then you're not doing them right. Obviously, if we were using road pins, well, obviously, a lot of people, a lot of ha happy hackers like to use road pins, okay? Stop them slipping on the roads. Remember, these screwing studs, these are the horses working on the turf, okay? They'll give you uh, traction on soft surfaces. To be honest, on arena surfaces, studs make not a lot of difference whatsoever. Anyone who uses studs on an arena surface is being a bit silly, really. Um, but certainly on the turf, they do make them. Remember, it's not just in wet conditions, it's more in dry conditions. That's when the turf gets really slippery. With road pins for use on, on roads, you probably show a lot of horses with them. Again, the optimum position for them is halfway between the last nail hole and the hill. So exactly where we put these studs. Obviously, if it's got stud holes and a pin, I'd probably put the pin a little bit further back than the stud hole. Okay, but again, to get the pin in, all we do is we get, I think it is a 4.6 mil drill. I don't know. Sure, it's four mil drill. And you, again, you get your center dot, Always centre dot it first, that stops the um, drill from skating, gives it something to get his teeth into. Drill straight through, and then you get your copper hammer or your copper plate on your anvil, and you rivet it in, okay? Some people use road nails, which is fine. Ideally, you need to have a stamp and pritchel and put a new nail hole in, halfway between the hill and the last nail hole, okay? Because if you put your road pins up in there, okay, it's too far forward. Okay, it's too far forward, you're gonna cause a rock of motion on the foot. Okay, so it needs to be further back. So you need to stamp a new nail hole in there. Okay, um, plug studs, exactly the same as um, when you put your stud holes in, except for you need to taper it slightly so you can drive the stud plug in. People don't generally use stud plugs much these days, okay, because obviously they were used a long time before we had the um, road pin drills but now a lot of people just put the road pins in and it's better because that tungsten pin is actually riveted straight into the shoe. Hasn't got like, and now the amount of times you use road nails, you'll come back and you'll find that the actual tungsten pin shed straight out the soft nail material. Okay. Uh, not only go into corkings and wedges and stuff, that's actually gonna be in the PowerPoint presentation. We'll discuss that. Not a lot really needs to be said about that because them traction devices were predominantly used in the past when we had different types of road surface. They're not really relevant now. I know some people still put them on, but they're not actually for any function. It's more of a fashion thing. We will talk about that in the PowerPoint presentation. Has anyone got any questions? Speak now or leave a comment below. Anyone?
Well, if no one's got any questions, I say if you think of anything, put them in the comments below. I will. <coughs> Those of you who handed um, pictures in of your shoes with the clips on, I'll put some feedback up tomorrow and I'll also get this PowerPoint narrated and I'll put that up tomorrow as well. So again, once that's up, have a look at it in your own time. You know, it's just really to support the knowledge side of this demonstration and talk about other traction devices, okay, and pros and cons, etc. Okay, but thanks for those who have watched this. Um, probably by now you would have put stud holes in, okay. But remember, this is another variant of just normal everyday shoemaking, but again, more pushed towards the competitionals. Okay, stay safe, speak to you soon.